والله يدعو الى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء الى صراط مستقيم Welcome once again to a new episode of Islam 101. And I am your host, Abu Usama al Dhahabi. And we have now arrived at the last section as it relates to the Khurafa al Rashidin, those rightly guided leaders from amongst the Muslims who took control of the helm of God in the Muslim community after the death of the Prophet and the Messenger of Islam. So we've dealt with so far some of the story and the virtues of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. And we also dealt with Umar al-Faruq, as well as the Dhul-Nurayn, Uthman ibn Affan, may Allah be pleased with all of them. Next in line in terms of the hierarchy or the superiority of the companions comes... Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali ibn Abi Talib. And Ali's kunya was Abu Turab, the father of the dirt. And he used to be loved to be called by that kunya because it was given to him by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I'm Abu Usama. So the kunya is when you name yourself the father of your oldest son. Or it can be your oldest daughter. Your oldest daughter. Ali radiallahu anhu he had a misunderstanding with his wife, and his wife was Fatima Zahra, the daughter of the Prophet wasallam, which is a virtue of Ali. Ali was raised up in the house of An-Nabuwa. He was raised up in the house of prophecy from a very young age, before Prophet Muhammad was even a Nabi, a Rasul. He was taking care of Ali. So it was only befitting that he married Fatima, who was also raised up in the house of An-Nabuwa. And as the Arab say, and we also have this saying in English, الطيور على أشكالها تقع Birds of a feather flock together. It only makes sense that Ali would be married to someone like Fatima and vice versa. Anyway, Ali had a misunderstanding with his wife, Fatima, something that happens between every man and every wife. And during the course of his misunderstanding, he did not divorce his wife. He surely didn't hit the daughter of Rasulullah. But he chose to go to the masjid to separate himself from his wife just to let everyone calm down. When he was in the masjid, the masjid of Rasulullah was very simple. It was dirt on the ground. He was lying in the dirt. When the Prophet came to the house of Fatima and he asked, where's Ali? She said, we had a misunderstanding and an argument, Ya Rasulullah. So he left and he went into the masjid. Rasulullah did not become angry at Ali for having a misunderstanding with his daughter And he took the side of his daughter. And then he went to get the boy, the husband, the son-in-law. No, he knows that this is something that is normal and natural. So he went to Ali, may Allah be pleased with him. And he woke him up. And when Ali got up, he had dirt all over him. So Rasulullah said, get up, O Abu Turab. Get up, father of the dirt. Which goes to show the sense of humor of Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it goes to show how the messenger of Allah was a fair and just father-in-law. So the kunya of Ali was Abu Turab, and he used to love that kunya. As it relates to his virtues, there are many virtues of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And that's one of the reasons that some of the major scholars in Al-Islam, they consider Ali to be better than Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman. In the past, in the past, the scholars of Al-Islam, especially some of the scholars of Al-Hadith, they were of the opinion that Ali was better than Abu Bakr, was better than Umar, was better than Uthman. But they still, those scholars, they still loved Abu Bakr, Umar, and Uthman. That's what the Shiite was a long time ago. And that's why you'll see in the books of Al-Hadith, 
الإمام البخاري الإمام مسلم أبو داود النسائي الترمذي ابن ماجه الإمام مالك الإمام أحمد may Allah have mercy upon all of them they used to narrate hadith from people who were Shiite but what Shiite? the Shiite of a long time ago the Shiite was simply the person who thought that Ali was better in virtues than the rest of the companions but they still loved Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman radiyallahu anhu and why did the scholars think that? They thought that because of the many, many, many virtuous hadith that show the superiority of Ali. Ali narrated in an authentic hadith that the Prophet said to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, la, Ya Ali, la yuhibbuka illa mu'min, wa la yubghiduka illa munafiq. Ali, no one loves you except that he's a believer. Every believer has to love Ali ibn Abi Talib. If you have something in your heart against Ali ibn Abi Talib, then there is not a small, but a big question mark over your Islam. We doubt your Islam. Ali, part of loving him is a peace and a part of Iman. No one loves you, Iman, ya Ali, except a believer, and no one hates you or has a problem with you except that he is a hypocrite. So there are hadith like that that would suggest that Ali is better. Where is there a hadith that says, you have to, part of loving Abu Bakr or Umar is Iman? You don't have that. It's only said about Ali. And similar to it is what happened in one of the battles with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was preparing to go for the war. So when he went for the war, he was a man of action. He wasn't the type of person who would say, okay guys, you go out and I'm going to sit here and I'm going to hide and rest with the women. No, he wasn't like that. Okay, guys, you are the soldiers. You go out and you fight and I'm just going to be here and I'm going to eat and I'm going to steal the money. You have a group of people protecting me. No, the prophet himself used to go out to make the jihad. So when he would go out in order to wage the battle, what? He needed someone in Al Medina to be behind, someone left behind to be responsible for the community. So what did he do? He used to choose different people. On this occasion, he chose Ali. Ali, you stay behind to protect the Muslims, to protect their property, to protect their monies, to protect their blood, their honor, to protect the families of the warriors, the Mujahideen. Ali, he wasn't comfortable with that. Ya Rasulullah, are you going to go out and you're going to leave me behind with the women and the children? I want to be first in the battlefield. I want to go with you. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told Ali, Ya Ali, what is your position? How do you feel? If you remain behind, you will be like Harun was to Musa. That's how you will be for me. When Musa, Moses, went on top of the Mount of Atur, he went on top of the mountain in order to receive from Allah the parchments. He stayed there for 40 days. While Musa was gone, Musa left his brother Harun behind. And Harun was a prophet after Musa. So Harun stayed with Bani Israel as the leader, as the one who they're going to get their religion from. So Rasulullah said, Ali, when I go out for the jihad and you remain here in Medina, you will be to me like Harun was to Musa. That's a tremendous hadith showing the superiority of Ali. But Rasulullah went on to say in that hadith, وَلَكِنْ لَا نَبِيَّ بَعْدِ But there's no prophet after me. When Musa went and Harun remained behind, Harun is a nabi, a prophet after Musa. Whereas when I'm going to jihad, if something happens to me, whether I come back or not, there's no Nabi after me. You're not a Nabi, Ya Ali. You're not a Nabi. You're not a prophet. You're not a messenger. So that goes to show the exalted position of Ali ibn Abi Talib in the religion. In addition to that, brothers, if you want to know the position of Ali and the courage of Ali and the power of Ali, all you have to do is take a look at some of the positions that he took. When the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam migrated from Mecca to al Medina, he migrated and he went with Abu Bakr. As we mentioned already, he told all of the companions, you, you can go first. You, you go second. You take this group of people. You go third. You go fourth. And he left Abu Bakr with him and then they left. And then he left behind Ali ibn Abi Talib. He told Ali, I want you to remain behind. And I want you to remain in my bed so that the non-Muslims would think that I'm still here. And Rasulullah left. And Ali radiallahu anhu remained in the bed of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The non-Muslims came in 
And they had agreed amongst themselves that all of us are going to stab him. This way, when we kill him, the tribe of Rasulullah cannot get revenge from no single tribe. They can't come against all of us, Beni Hashem. They can only come against one tribe if one person killed them. So the people came to the bed of Rasulullah and they were about to stab him. And lo and behold, it was Ali. Allah, ya ikhwani, I swear by Allah. If Rasulullah asked one of us to stay behind and you know that if you don't pull the cover over, maybe they'll come and they'll stab you. How many people would be ready to sacrifice his life like that? It required a lot of iman, a lot of faith. And it required a lot of personal character, that which Ali had. May Allah be pleased with him. Another very important point as to why Ali remained behind is that the Prophet wasallam was in possession and he was in charge of the amanat. He had the trust that was left to him by many of the people because he was known as Muhammad al-Amin, the trustworthy one. So he left Ali behind so that when he made the hijrah, when he went to Mecca, Medina, Ali was responsible for giving everyone their money back that Rasulullah had in his possession, which goes to show again, as Muslims, it is not permissible for us to say we can cheat non-Muslims. We can be unjust to non-Muslims. Now, this is not our religion. Don't let a people's oppression towards you or your hatred towards them. Don't allow that to make you be a person who's not just. No, be just. This is closer to a taqwa. So Rasulullah has illustrated that lesson to us in this hadith. He could have stole everyone's money and just left to Medina and said, this is my money, we're going to use it against them. No, he left his companion behind and he put his life on the line in order to give the people back their amanat. So as it relates to the virtues of Ali, you can see clearly that Ali was a virtuous companion. There's another example that I want to share with you and an, a topic and an issue that we hope to do an episode solely on this. And that is Ahlul Bayt. Who are they? And what is this concept? The people of the Prophet's household, Ahlul Bayt. They have a special position in the religion. In the religion. Allah Ta'ala said in the Quran, Verily Allah wants to purify you and clean you up, O Ahlul Bayt. And he wants to give you the complete, absolute purification. That's the Ahlul Bayt of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Ali was from the Ahlul Bayt. He was an Imam of Ahlul Bayt. And they have a special position in this religion. Right now, if someone was from Ahlul Bayt sitting at this particular place, he has a special position in the religion of Al-Islam. And inshallah, we're going to explain some of the rights of Ahlul Bayt when we come back. And we'll continue the discussion about the fada'il or the virtues of Abi Turab, Ali ibn Abi Talib, radiallahu anhu. Islam 101. Welcome back. We've been discussing some of the virtues of Ali ibn Abi Talib. May Allah be pleased with him. And we wanted to mention some things concerning him being one of the leaders of Ahlul Bayt. And this is a very important issue. And hopefully, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to dedicate a segment solely to the virtues of Ahlul Bayt as a group, as a whole. Who are they? And what are their hukuk or their rights over us? So the virtues of Ali, as we mentioned before, they are many when you count them. And that's why some of the scholars felt that Ali was better than Abu Bakr and Umar. But whenever scholars disagree in this religion, one scholar says something, another scholar says something else, we are to look at the proofs and then we take the position that is the strongest. And what position is the strongest as it relates to who's the best companion? The position that says that Abu Bakr and Umar are stronger and better than Ali. Abu Bakr is the best, and then Umar, and then Uthman, and then Ali. Wallahi, Abu Bakr is better than Ali. Abu Bakr is better than Fatima. Abu Bakr is better 
than Hassan and Hussein. Abu Bakr is better than anyone from Ahlul Bayt. Anyone from Ahlul Bayt. And that's why when they asked Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, men ahabbun nasi lake, who do you love the most? He said, first his wife, Aisha. No, not from them, from the other people. He said, Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr. So as I mentioned, we have to get into more detail so that you guys, the people in the audience will understand Muslims and non-Muslims alike. We have to discuss in detail who are the Ahlul Bayt. So we will dedicate, inshallah, a segment to that. We're going to stop here, sadly, as it relates to giving you any more information about the four Khulafa al-Rashidin, these leaders of the Muslims, in order to have the input from the panel that we have before you. So, very quickly, guys, anyone, do you have any questions or any comments? Let's start with Sardar, if you have anything. I don't have any ideas. How about you, Nick? Uh, I'd like to ask you, Ali was the fourth and the last of the Khulafa al-Rashidin. Why was it so? Was there uh, nobody from Prophet com companions? Why was he the last? Why was Ali the fourth rightly guided Khalifa? Why was he the fourth one? And uh, the last. And the last. Uh, concerning that issue, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his companions after him, they were the ones who he himself used to say who was the best from the companions. And he mentioned as the order we have mentioned already, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and then Ali. So due to that, that's what the companions understood. And then after the Prophet, those people were the ones who led the Ummah, they led the nation. But after Ali, they, some of the scholars consider Umar ibn Abdul Aziz to be from the Khulafa al-Rashidin, and some of them don't. Because after Ali, we have his son, al Hassan, who is better than Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan is better than Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. They're better. But those are the four who are considered to be the rightly guided khulafa because this is what the scholars of Al-Islam agree to. That's what the scholars agree upon. And Allah knows best. How about you, Abdullah? Indik a shaykh? Yeah, indik a It's okay. Uh, what did you do between Sina Ali and um, Muawiyah Abi Sufyan? Uh, Abdullah, he said, what was the reason between that we had the fitna and the war between Sayyidina Ali and Muawi? Listen, I want to say to you guys, you Muslims especially, we do not say Sayyidina to Ali only. You'll hear a lot of people when you hear Ali's name, they say, Karram Allahu Wajhahu. Why do you only say that about Ali? They say because he didn't make sajda, he didn't make prostration to any idol. Uthman didn't make a prostration to idol. Abu Bakr never made prostration to Ali to an idol. Why do you say Sayyidina only for Ali? This is from what we should leave alone. We say about all of the companions, radiallahu anhu, Ali shouldn't have any possession that's special or over Abu Bakr Umar. If you say anyone deserves Sayyidina, it's Abu Bakr it's Umar, it's Uthman. So we have to be careful about giving those special characteristics to Ali. Anyway, as it relates to the problem between them, it was due to the fact that there was ijtihad on both of their parts. Those people came in and they killed the khalif and the leader, Uthman. They killed him, assassinated him. And then Ali became the leader. Muawiyah was the governor for Uthman in Sham, in a place called Sham, where Syria and Jordan in that area. So when Uthman was the leader, his governor was Muawiyah. So Muawiyah said, his point of view was, hey, listen, I recognize, Ali, that you have the right to be the Khalifa, but I'm not going to give you the Pledge of Allegiance. I'm not going to give you the Bayah until we deal with the ones who assassinated Uthman. Because still, technically, I'm under the authority of Uthman. Plus, Uthman was my relative. We want those people's blood for what they did. Ali said, no, I agree with you. They're wrong. We should deal with them. But we have to get stability in the Islamic State. Just give me the bayah and then we'll deal with them at another time. Right now there are too many problems going on. So they had a position where they disagreed on that point. And the haq, the truth was, was with Ali. So the point is, both of them will get rewarded, even though people lost their lives. The Prophet told us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إِذَا اجْتَهَدَ الْحَاكِمُ فَأَصَابَ فَلَوْهُ أَجْرًا وَإِنْ أَخْطَأَ فَلَوْهُ أَجْرٌ وَاحِدٌ if a scholar went about an issue and he tried his best to arrive at the truth and he got it right, he'll get two rewards. If he got it wrong, he'll get one reward. Muawiyah was mujtahid. He was a person who was trying his best. 
Ali was a mujtahid, trying his best to come up with what was correct. So Ali gets two rewards and Muawiyah gets one. And we do not, we do not say Muawiyah was oppressive. Muawiyah went against the truth. Muawiyah went against the Quran. Ali was wrong. He, la, our swords and our weapons didn't participate in the war. So we have to keep our tongues tied up from saying this and that. We love all of them. And Allah said that he's pleased with all of them. And they're all in paradise. What about you, Nazmi? Isn't it us like, um, how come um, whenever um, our Christians, it is about Shiism, is connected to Ali? Concerning the issue of Shiism, we already explained to you what the Shiite used to be. The person who was mutashayir. He was the person who thought that Ali was better, but he still loved Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman. Now Shiite has become something else. Shiite now means that the person loves Ali and the other members of Ahl al-Bayt, but they hate the other companions, except five or six. They say Salman is okay, Miqdad is okay, Bilal is okay, just a few of them are okay, but the rest of them have apostated from Al-Islam. Nah, this is not acceptable. This is not the Sarat al-Mustaqib. This is not the Sarat al-Mustaqib. The Shiite today, they have an allegiance to Ali because of al-Ghulu. It's like a person taking one ayat, وَيْنُ لِلْمُسَلِّينَ Woe unto those who pray. And then he stops there. So those virtues of Ali are clear. So they love Ali. And rightly so, you shall love Ali. But what about the rest of the ayat of the Qur'an? What about the rest of the ahadith of Rasulullah? So this is the danger of al-ghulu in the religion. Al-ghulu means going overboard, being extravagant and going overboard. Loving someone too much or hating someone too much. Whenever you love and you hate too much, you're going to be a vadam. You're going to oppress. How? If you love someone too much, you're going to raise him above his level. That's ghulu. Oh, Al Kitab, don't go overboard in your book, in your religion. Don't raise Isa, Jesus, above where he deserves. And the other one, if you have Ghulu the other way, you hate a person so bad, you put him below where he doesn't deserve. You can't take the truth when the truth is with him. So those people, they had Ghulu in this issue. And we say, if you are afflicted with this Shiaism, don't allow yourself to be an Asir, a slave to the opinions of other people. Read the Quran and read the all of the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Love in Alul Bayt is from the Deen. Hain in Alul Bayt is Kufr and Nifaq, disbelief and hypocrisy. We're going to bring this segment to a close, this important segment, and we hope to see you in Inshallah in some of the future episodes of Islam 101. May Allah make it easy for us and easy for you. Looking forward to seeing you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. <laughs> Islam.